hey, 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 good people. Grits or cream of wheat? Who the hell is racist? Does anyone ever ask if they touch your hair? <laughs> Woo. Black Like Me. You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G., a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hey, 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 good people. Welcome to another exciting episode of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. And I just want to say you need to just really sit back because we are going to have a powerful, insightful, and very truthful discussion with Mr. Tony Chambers, Dr. Tony Chambers. He was featured here in Madison, and I'll put a link inside this podcast, but he was recently featured in Capital Times. Um, It's our our local weekly um, newspaper in an expose that's called Culture Shock. Former Edgewood College students and staff complained of racist campus culture. And um, we're going to talk about what life is like once they put a black man on the cover with his arms folded. That looks kind of familiar. With his arms folded, talking about life here in Madison. Dr. Chambers, Tony, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, I'm so glad to, to be here and glad for the invitation. Man, I'm looking forward to this. Talk. I am too. This is going to be interesting. This is going to be so interesting. So we're going to talk. This young man is um, also a Chicago and I didn't realize that he's lived all over the country, but we're going to get into that a little bit later. But, but Tony, we, we do something on, on um, black like me. That's called black ice breaker. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. So I'm we just, here. we ask different <laughs> And people listen for those of you listening people actually look a little nervous when i say that and it's just all fun we're not we're not gonna take anybody's card or nothing we just we're just trying to see where people at and so uh and so tony grits or cream of wheat what's cream of wheat that's what i'm talking about what is that what is exact it's cat food that's what it is it's kitty what, litter that's what it is people that don't eat grits you take the card you take that that's right you take that card now now you, you is it <laughs> do you like butter on your on your on your grits a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Okay, here's a deciding. Here's how I decide who my friends are or not. Uh, do you put sugar or do you put salt <laughs> on your grits? Listen, I'm, I may give you a third option. I okay. don't put anything but butter on my grits. Okay, all right. That's better than that's better than putting salt on them. So I gotta I say, I can't imagine salt on grits. You know, I do a little bit to flavor them because it actually makes the butter pop a little bit. Yeah. But I like the sugar. But then I guess that's how my grandmother. You know, my grand. You know, my grandmother. Um, helped to take care of us while my mom worked. My mom was a single mother. And so she would make those grits, those real old fashioned grits. But I would put my eggs in it. Oh, I chop, chop up my bacon and put it in it. I break up my toast and put it in it. They now call them breakfast bowls. We just call it bro- <laughs> We call it breakfast. breakfast. <laughs> we call it breakfast. Hey, listen, I, I, you may remember this. Laurie's seasoning sauce. Of course I do. I put some of that in my grits. Do you really? True. I put that in my potato salad, but it, but it works in grits too. That season is okay. Okay, I might have to try that. Laurie season. I might. I might have to. Tr- I might have to try that. Okay. So now, listen. I found out that we're both, you know, from from the same generation. That you also were born in Chicago, so you lived on the West Side, and um, and that's where I lived before we moved to Madison. So when you were growing up, were blue jeans iron? Did you iron jeans? Let me tell you something. I iron my jeans. I still iron my jeans. <laughs> still I iron, iron my, my boys' jeans. jeans. <laughs> I iron everything. We used to have a competition in my household. I have three brothers and one sister. Who had the best crease? Who had the best crease? You can tell the best. crease by the sound when you put them on. When you put your leg in the pants, it goes, shh. See, young people don't know nothing about that. You know, when, my friend, my wife friends used to say, Alex, why are you ironing your jeans? They're jeans. They're supposed to be wrinkled. And I said, no, no you got to have that. You got to have that crease. No, you got to have a crease in your jeans. Oh, got my to. Good, oh, my goodness. Got to. Hey, when you were growing up, did you ever yell at your mother or grandmother? Or who, <laughs> did you ever just say, yell at them, say, I hate you. I wish you were dead. Get out of my room. You ever do that, Tony? Wish you were dead. That's a word that she would probably use if I yelled at her. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to make you I took you into, I brought you into this world. I'll take you. That's right. That's right. I remember that from Huxtable. They got that from someplace. (laughs) Hey, collards or turnips? Collard greens, man. That's what I'm saying. Collard greens. That's what I'm saying. Let's see. Um, Did you have a jerry curl growing up? No, what's the most interesting thing you did to your hair? Growing up, you 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 had one of them Tony Curtis's, didn't you? You remember the Tony Curtis? <laughs> what a Tony, Tony Curtis. Curtis is where I guess Tony Curtis, you know, he's a white actor. Yeah, 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 it yeah. was kind of slicked in the side and kind of like, like almost like pompadourish on top. No, man. But some of the brothers, you know, they used to. Um, Eddie Kane Jr. used to wear that in um, Five Heartbeats, and you have a scarf oh, tied around got, the yeah, side yeah, to yeah, kind of yeah. keep the top. Never, nope. What's the strangest thing you did? Straightening comb. You look like a straightening comb brother. I didn't do a straightening comb. See, my mother natural. 
Really? She would not allow us to put to chemical put anything in our hair. Now we put some Vaseline in there. But you gotta put it because it's got it so you can comb it out. Yeah, you got the Vaseline and then <laughs> <laughs> Black You know, and I show sometimes we do we, we take fifteen seconds and we say, What are all the purposes of Vaseline? And but you're right, black people hair. I put black I put Vaseline in my hair this week just to kind of help it to lay down when I brush it. I put it in my hair, I put it on my ashy skin, everything. E- Eli. Do you yeah. now Eli grew yeah. up in Iowa. Eli, do you put do you put Vaseline in, in your hair? I don't. I, I think my mom had it around the house. But for um, hair? Um but no, not for hair. Okay, all right. Just thought not I'd that check I know. Okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> now do you remember when we were kids, Tony, we would not always call pop by its name. We would say like either red or grape. Did you do that like red or grape? No, grape's still the flavor, but but like people say red or uh, uh, yeah, I just remember people calling it Red Pop and not even talking. I don't even know if Red Pop was strawberry or cherry, or but it was red. It was red. And we called it Pop. We didn't call it soda. Yeah, in Chicago, we called it Pop. So when I moved here and people referred to soda, that just sort of rubbed me the wrong way because no. we called it Pop. was not soda. And everything was a Coke. Everything uh, was a Coke. You know, that's that's true in Atlanta right now. I, like When I've gone down there, they'll say, do you want, would you like a Coke? And I said, um... Sure. It goes, okay, well, do you want a root beer? Do you want a grape? Do That's you want do you want, you know, a strawberry coke? I said, What? Y'all got flavors? <laughs> <laughs> now they do. Yeah, I know now they do, but it was a coke was everything. Oh my goodness. And so, um, did you have play cousins growing up? People who weren't really your cousins, but you thought they were your whole life? You know, that's a delicate question, man. Oh, okay. We want to just move on to the next one. Mm, yeah, I, I had play cousins, play uncles. You found out they were your brothers play, and sisters. You know, hey, listen, man. <laughs> <take> <laughs> listen, <the fifth. laughs> listen, strangest thing. Papa was a Papa was a rolling. <laughs> doo, doo, doo. Let me see. Did you did you have did you have no anybody named Mookie, Junebug, John John, Lip Maine growing up? Did you, did you have friends with those kinds? Oh, of I had John John. You had John. I had John John, and I had uh, what, what was my guy's name? His name was uh. Oh crap! I can't remember his name, but it was one of those. It was names. one of those names. It was one of those names. Abadaba was his name. Abadaba. <laughs> Black people are so creative. Um, did, did you grow up around um, your grandparents? Did yes. you live near them? Did your grandmother watch watch stories? You see, my grandmother passed away, and uh, when I was really, really young, but. My- Stories. That's funny. If I say stories to people nowadays, they don't know what I'm talking about. So, oh, so no. what's what's the story? We, today they're called soap operas. They're called soap operas or soaps. Yeah, I mean that's what they do. You know, young and the restless. But we called my grandmother. They would say, "Oh, shh, sit down, someone. Be quiet. My story is about to come on." You know, my mother. We knew it. We she didn't have to tell us. She knew because when the TV went on and it was black and white, when the TV went on, we had to sit down. She would read. She would watch stories. She would read these magazines that kind of like stories yeah oh my goodness i man i love it let me see if we got any other things on here i want to ask you to be um do you know what it means to split the pole when oh, you and your... i do that today man you split the pole i do not i, mean, I tell people <laughs> yeah. not to split the pole i tell my kids don't go another saturday you come around here man it's a superstition i it believe is. it yeah oh my goodness and so I again for it. folks who might be new to black like me split the pole is when you're going down the street and it's three or four of you you all need to go on the same side of the light post, the street sign, the mailbox. You know when they used to have mailboxes That's right. outside. That's right. If you do it, you have to stop and go back, go back around. around. But you, you do not. It's called splitting the pole. Like, do not split the do pole. Do not go that way. You know, this is this is something I'm going to add to my list, but I don't have it on it yet. But when you were in Chicago, wherever you lived, do you, did older people refer to grocery shopping as making groceries? My aunt used to say... She, they were, she had friends who would say, oh, man, it's Making Saturday. It's groceries. time to go make groceries. But that's what they refer to grocery shopping as. Does that sound familiar at all? That don't sound I mean, no, I didn't hear that one. Making groceries. Making groceries, she would say. Make man, groceries. let me see. Did your family cook black-eyed peas on New Year's Eve? Every day. New Year's? They Every made, day? They, they cooked black We ate a lot of beans, man. Yeah, yeah. But black-eyed peas, we had to have some greens, some collards. Man, you're making me hungry. You know what I mean? Some cornbread in a skillet. Oh my god! In a skillet, skillet. Was that the, was that the hot water cornbread or the the like the flat pancake type or just... no? It was the hot water cornbread. Obviously, my aunt had that. I need to get that recipe. I tell you, my 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 aunt used to cook um, this uh, German chocolate cake in a skillet. In a, oh, see, yes, see, indeed. old school knew how to do stuff. I know. Hey, did um did you grow up in a family where someone asked you, boy, come over here and scratch my back? I... <laughs> <laughs> a lot of that. Wash my feet, scratch my back. <laughs> Because I was, I did. It. I was talking to my sister the other day. She said, oh, "Is it just our family, or is it just black people?" But we'll be like, "Hey, come here. Can you scratch my back?" So I bought my wife her own back scratcher. So she got one. I got one. Do you remember when people used to? Did you grow up in a home? And this might be my last question. When you grew up in a home and people said, um, um, "Hey, grandma, mama, can you scratch my head?" Do you remember? <laughs> Let me tell you something. 
To this day, hey. I still ask my mama to scratch my head. Eli. Yeah. You're from Iowa. I am. Do, do y'all scratch each other's head in Iowa? Do you like, has, has, has your grandmother ever asked, has your mom ever asked your grandmother, hey, big mama, can you, Medea, <laughs> can you, can you scratch, can you scratch, can you get some, oil, can you get some Vaseline to scratch my head? Did y'all do that growing up? That never happened. Maybe some back scratching. Some back scratching. But, um, you ever had your head scratched, Eli? No, I then don't. Then Eli, you ain't no. been loved. Oh, I know. Eli, I mean, you're still I a virgin. Know. Eli, you're still a virgin. <laughs> you need to be touched. You need to be touched. You need to be touched. The truth's coming out. Oh, it's coming out. That's that's like the woman. Miss Seely, you still a virgin? <laughs> All right, we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna, we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk to Miss Steenich about that, um, Eli. All right. Oh my goodness, that is so funny. And okay, so, I, I got I got one for you. Please, please I got go a ahead. Couple for you. Uh oh. Uh oh. You ever had gummy cheese? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Let me tell you something. It makes the best grilled cheese sa- grilled cheese sandwiches Sandwich. in the world. You talking about the one that comes in a great big block? Truth, truth, yes. And then you have to slice. Now Velveeta looks like it, but it was twice it a thing. But it it's is not. not. But that 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 you know it's so funny. We didn't know we were poor eating that stuff, and our mothers didn't want us to go to school talking about government cheese. But every comedian, every actor, every every person who's made it understands that's the best cheese in the world. It'll clog up your arteries, you know, for the rest of your life. But that was some. Yes, I've had some, and it it's was good. Real and some macaroni and cheese, man. Oh my goodness! Yes, you see what I'm saying? real yes. macaroni, and cheese. real macaroni and cheese. Yes, we did. We did have some government cheese. That stuff melted well. <laughs> <laughs> I got one for you. Go for it. It's pimping heart. Oh, pimping is easy. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! Is easy, man. I heard that on Black Jeopardy on Saturday Night Live, and I cry when I heard, when I heard that. <laughs> okay, I got one more. This see, see, you're from my generation, so you get this. Did you know people who dip snuff? A uh, dip, oh, man, dip, I remember yeah, people dip snuff. Who dip, yes, and spit it out in and the spit can. It and can t- t- man, that's some nasty stuff. That's some that's, that's some nasty, nasty stuff, stuff man. When, oh, do you know what a face bowl is? <laughs> <What's that? laughs> we call them sinks now we're growing up they're like boy you better go in there and wash up in that face bowl a face bowl a yes. face bowl and you know, are you talking about the root like the like there used to be some that would go under your bed that you pull out it and was put a water. white thing that had a rat, a red rim around it was metal yes we had a face bowl <laughs> we had a, now did you do a face rag okay yes we call them face rags now, when I grew up and I was in sports and we started having a shower, my white friends did not have a wash rag, a face rag or a wash rag. They would just go to work on a, on a bar of soap and they say, hey, you, you need some of the soap. We were taught you do oh, not no, touch you the soap it. on your body. You put your soap on the rag and then you go to work. That's true. That's the only way you clean your... I do it now. So then, I, mean, <laughs> I can't wash myself without a face rag. You know, and some people... I can't remember my cousins. I don't, think they, I don't think my grandmother trained me this way. But my younger cousins had a face rag and a butt rag. When they had to... <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness the fcc is gonna take me up they're gonna start regulating me, gonna, oh me. my gosh you okay i better me. i better get off these black eyes breakers i better get off of these but man thank you i got eli we need to set up people that are in my generation i'm tired of these young people that don't know nothing they can do rubik's cube and they can do calculus and they sleep but they don't know what a face rag is man they gotta know what a face they gotta rag know what a face rag and a butt is. rag and a butt rag oh oh man so listen tony we i i, I man the community has been uh, we we both live in Madison, Wisconsin, yep. and um and the community's been wrestling with the reality of our racial disparities. Yep. And um and so I appreciate the fact that you when your article came out, you talked really honestly about what your experiences um have been. And so I'll reference the article just a little bit, but as I told you earlier, I just wanted to talk about life True. before this, after this. Um, what Madison is like compared to other places where you've lived and not just harp on this and walk through it. But the reason why I did want to talk to you a little bit about it is that when you put your business out here like this, and I, and I have a sense of what that feels like, it may not be the exact same thing, but what it feels like, um, people only want to talk to you about that. People who've never talked to you before, um, people want to tell you, um, well, if it's so bad here, go back. I don't know if you, have you heard any of that yet? I have heard that. I have heard other things that are even more caustic. Really? Toxic, what have sure. what have you heard? You can say. I mean, we're not we're not FCC regular. We can we can cuss. We can say stuff. We no, know. I've heard to take your fucking ass out of town. Well, get we out can't of we here. can't say that though. Okay. I no, I'm just. No, <laughs> <laughs> I did not say. No, that. no. But they, they said, said that to you. Take your fucking ass up out of here. Get that's crazy. What uh, what I've heard. I get it through text. I get it through uh, my phone. I get it emails. Man, are you serious? I want to tell people my family's been. Here, here's one of my white mentors taught me this trick. He says, Alice, when people are talking ignorant to you like that, ask them, when did your family start talking, speaking English around the dinner table? 
because my family's been speaking English for 400 years. And yours been speaking for like 85 or 90, and you're going to tell me to go back home? I built your home. I Don't let me get started. Yeah, I know. So I'm back to you. I'm back I know. To you. It's, 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 the, it's because, the language of the day. Because of, because of the article, people are saying that kind of stuff. Or was that going on? Anytime someone makes a complaint about the status quo, is that part of the response? That's part, part of, of the my response? experience. Yeah, I mean, in part of the article, I reference uh, an incident that happened at the school uh, when uh, somebody during right after the election, somebody put a, a little sticky note, apparently, on uh, the door or the wall of one of, of our cultural center, our inclusion and diversity center, mm-hmm. uh, with the intention, as it turns out, uh, to intimidate, right? Wow. To intimidate folks. Sure, and they know who went to this center. Sure, sure. So we had to decide, you know, what to do with this. And according to the law, mm-hmm. the Cleary Act, they define that situation as a hate crime. Now, was it a hate crime in the larger sense of hate crime? Mm-hmm. Was it, you know, West Virginia? Was it? Sure, sure. Yeah, it it sure. wasn't that. It wasn't to that level. But we didn't have any other options, so we had to call it hate crime. And thus, there were some other things that had to go along with that. We had to report it to the police, had to notify the community that this was what's happening. So we put it out there. And at that point. Everybody who was involved in the decision, <clears throat> this team of people, this response right. team, started getting calls and emails and death threats and death threats. Truth. Death threat. It went on this radio station. Uh, and I don't know the, the person's name, I think was Vicki McKenna or mm. something like that. I've been that. on her show one time years ago. It was, I mean, she sort of, she sort of, sort of cut me a new butthole after mm. that and said, you know, this is a laughing stock. This is silly. This is stupid. Go back to where you come from, came from. And I'm like, you know, she's I'm not, just, she's not from here. Listen, it doesn't matter. Does it? No, no. Because they think they can police us. She thinks she can police us and tell us where to go. No, here is theirs. There is ours. Now she knows because so Vicki McKenna has this conservative talk show. Mm-hmm. Um, so she knows that that view is not necessarily welcome to Madison. And she talks about the hostility of it. So why would she not think that there's hostility? That's based in other, because our state motto is forward, because we're the home of Robert La Follette and and progressive thought. So she feels like her view is counterintuitive, counterproductive. She feels the pressure, the pushback. Why would she not think that there would be pushback in other arenas, like someone who's African American and 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 entering some a place that's both white and progressive supposedly. And so when people become just that uh, myopic and 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 not thinking that um the pushback they're feeling can't be felt in through through other or seen or experienced through other lean, uh, lenses just shows me the short-sightedness well, of it her was argument. Well, short-sighted, but it was also prophetic. In retrospect, sure. I mean it, it was prophetic. Remember, it was right after the election in 2016. Mhm. And it was at the foothill of this mountain that was building, that was growing around what kind of rhetoric is acceptable, who may be, <clears throat> who may be, excuse me, no, you're right. uh, receptive to this, this kind of rhetoric uh, that may not have been receptive in the past or may have been hidden in the past. It, you know, her rhetoric at the beginning is now considered the standard. Right. And she knew this and they knew this. Right. So to call somebody a snowflake or to call somebody, uh, call somebody out and tell them they need to go back. I mean, we may have thought 2016 that, you know, that was that's unheard of. We're right. progressive. Right. You know, right. Blah, blah, blah. But now it's 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 mainstream. Right. Well, it, it, actually, it actually signals back to the rhetoric of go back to Africa. Same. So just get up out of here. And, and, and yeah. And so po- folks, folks know this. Our listeners are largely white. They, so, so, so they they listen in to get insight. But what I want to say to my black like me family, particularly those who are not African-American, what Tony is talking about is part of the pushback you get when you say, ouch, now, as long as you take it and you're a good old boy and you do the soft shoe and you just come along and you just do everything you're supposed to do. Um, then you're really fine because then you prove that slavery, racism, separate but equal Jim Crow really did not have an impact on the world. But when you say this is unfair, yes. when you talk about something, I mean, I mean, basically, when you when you talk about these things, 
you become the whistleblower. But to get death threats and be told to go back home, then you start worrying about your children and your family. And that shouldn't be in a progressively liberal community. And if I were white and liberal in Madison, this would piss me off because I would say, all right, it's these kinds of white people that give us a bad name. Because because I know that's what I feel like sometimes when I when my people when our people do something that's really heinous I think oh come on now y'all gonna make everybody think serious I'm a bank robber or something because we have that sort of collective sense it does I think what happens to progressive whites is that they think um, that's not us and they become afraid and they want to shut you down because you somehow become the barometer of um, that's the antithesis that's right of 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 their reality. Rather than coming down on white folks, rather than showing up on Edgewood's campus and say, Dr. Flanagan and others, what the hell are y'all thinking? They want to <laughs> silence you because that makes their world perfect. So we build the world on free labor. Now we got to babysit you and keep you happy in it. This is the expectation. This is the expectation. Thus, we have this systemic system where folks over here shut you down for whatever reason. Folks sure. over here shut you down. And then they tell you in so many words. And I've heard this throughout my whole life. Uh, you should be more respectable. Wow. You should be more respectable. I mean, in different words, it's like you shouldn't be so loud. You right. shouldn't be so angry. You shouldn't rather be so, than being an uppity Negro. That too. Rather than being that too. <laughs> but it's been mostly these code words. It's been like code. It's it's, 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 it's a lot of code. They say you know you should be more like this. But what I've come to understand, Alex, is that. I've never gotten respect by being respectable. That's right. You know, I've never gotten the respect that I deserve by being respectable. Right. You know, and I think I'm a fairly respectable kind of guy. Definitely. My mom always taught me respect those who respect you. And and I'm quick to understand when people don't respect me, when they sure. disrespect me. So I teach that to my kids. And I'm like, definitely. Listen, you so you should. I think what's surprising, though, Tony, is. We're intuitive. Now, what happens is people think that um, that maybe we're whining. I tell people <clears throat> it takes too much energy to get up in the morning and deal with racism. I would much prefer to live on my merits True. because I know I'm sharp. I'm smart. I'm trained. I'm black. And I've been raised in Pharaoh's household. No, that's right. I was raised up on campus. Know right. I know this community. So you got to get way earlier and step way later uh, to be sharper than I am. And so when I'm able to peep game and understand all right they're not calling me the n-word they're saying african-american but they treat me you know um uh, i can i can feel it people get upset because we know how to call that stuff out and oh. again we're not getting up in the morning trying what racism you know we're not the you know we're not the the race hunters but you know when folks are saying all the right things but acting like a fool act right acting like a fool and you know it I you mean, you've been around long enough and sometimes when i was younger things slipped past me and it was like that felt funny, but right. You know, That's fu it felt funny. That felt funny. Exactly. You know, because I, I grew up in a neighborhood where it was all black folks, and we didn't hear that stuff. Right. We we didn't say it. We didn't say it. We didn't hear it. And Nobody what? called you art articulate no. when you were young, no. young, smart child growing up in an all black community. They didn't say, "Wow, you're you know you're articulate." No, didn't say you're articulate, or, or you're not like the rest of them. Right. And for you all, that's cold for just saying, "Wow, we're surprised that you can um." That you can speak English. What, who was the gentleman that was the um, an advisor to President Clinton? Vernon, Vernon um, Jordan. Vernon Jordan. He yeah. wrote a book called Vernon Can Read. <laughs> he was someplace working at a country club to get money for law school. Yeah. And he was reading his law books on one of his breaks. And one of the guys at the country club said, look, Vernon can read. Because he just assumed because he was working there, he was some um, illiterate field for hand sure. who was coming for in sure. doing some work. And this man was about to become an advisor to the president of the United States in just a few years. And one of the biggest political handlers of the universe. Yes, yes. He knew his stuff. And but, <clears throat> but they were surprised. <clears throat> well, yeah. Man. Let me, so you came to Madison. You took a job at Edgewood. I did. And you came from Toronto. I did. So although you were born in the U.S., grew up here, you were working in Toronto. And you said, you that was a, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, if I, um, that was a tenured position, right? Oh, yeah. I was tenured. I was a department chair in the largest university. and How the hell did they get you to, to Edgewood from that? Well. <laughs> I knew they were recruiting you, though. <laughs> well, yes I heard and no. I heard about it. No, 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 no. They did not recruit me. They didn't? No, no. No, 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 no. My wife is from Madison. Okay. Right? 
and our children were going off to college. We have two boys that's, that were at home at the time. And we didn't have any family in, in Toronto. Love Toronto, by the way. I've only been there twice. I love it, too. It's very diverse. Oh, it's ex- That's an international city. And it's it's normative. I mean, yes, that, yes. that's natural. It's not like contrived. I did not feel odd when I was there. That's the point I'm trying to make. I did not feel like a unicorn. Right. So... You know, she we, we decided my mom is, is in the Chicago area and they were getting older. So we said, maybe now is the time. Our kids are going to be in colleges in the U.S. because they didn't want to live in. They didn't want to go to school in Canada. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Parents are getting older. And I had this option where it was early retirement. It was a small window at the University of Toronto where you could retire if you have 10 years in and um some other criteria and i had met the criteria for a full pension wow plus benefits wow so i jumped on it took my stuff and then i started applying for jobs in madison because that's where we were going to come we're going to move to so i knew somebody at edgewood and i saw an ad in the paper Mm -hmm. in the chronicle of higher ed so i applied I applied, I, mm-hmm. you know, not knowing a whole lot about Edgewood. And, and quite frankly, I wanted to be in a small place, uh, not the University of Wisconsin, not in a big place, because mm-hmm. uh, I've done that. Sure. And, and I said, you know, I want to be in a place where I could touch somebody. And I liked their values. When I read the values about compassion. Search for and truth, truth and compassion, justice. I'm reading them now. Partnership. Yes. Community. Yes. It was all, it may was speaking to me. Sure. And I thought, you know, I'm at a point in my life where meaning matters. And that had meaning to me. Wow. So I applied, got the gig. and About then, three years ago? How, how long ago? What year was that? It was in 2015. 2015. It was toward the fall of 2015. I didn't show up until January 2016. All right. So, and then right before I came, I mean, I was at an event a board meeting or something during August of 2015 Mm -hmm. and was introduced to a bunch of students. And one of the students asked me an appropriate question. They say, well, what should we call you? Dr. Chambers, vice president Chambers, Dean Chambers. And then from the back corner, there were these three young women, uh, young white women. And you could, hear them briefly giggling and then they said out loud to the group or blackie or darkie right (laughs) my 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 mic didn't go out my my jaws just dropped and i and i know that from you know just having just knowing a little bit about your story but they said that out loud out loud out loud i mean and, and again if i was as smart as i thought i was i would have picked that sign up right there and said This is not the place for me. But I had already retired from my gig. We were selling the house in Toronto. My wife had retired. I resigned from her gig. So we were moving to Madison. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Doctor. I got to call you Dr. Chambers on this one. So so this is said. Who else is in the room? Any other university? Any other um, campus officials? Oh, there was there was like two or three campus officials. Those who were escorting me around to these different places and a bunch of students, student leaders. Right. Uh, and and none of the officials stopped and said, you disrespectful heifers. That is say, inappropriate. Did not say. In fact, when I asked if these girls could be, you know, taken through the judicial system, because I read the codes. I mean, sure. I know what, what's a violation of codes. They, the girls and the judicial people decided that they were going to have, while I was still on campus, a, a little conference with me. They were going to invite the girls in some of the staff that were present to have a discussion about, you know, you know, restorative justice. Let's, let's do that. I'm like, okay, let's see how this turn out. And so the girl showed up, they had invited two faculty members uh, to come and be their support. To be the student support. To be the student support. Yes. Two faculty members. And so we Wait, all a search for truth, compassion, <laughs> justice, partnership, community anchored in our Dominican heritage, anchored in our Dominican heritage, anchored in our Dominican. St. Dominic would be spinning into the grave if he knew knew the kind of shit that was going down in that room. That's ridiculous. 
you know, what I've come to understand, and I'm an understanding brother, you know, what I've come to understand is religion aside, values aside, the world we live in, the society we live in, infects and affects every white person that exists in this in this society. You know what I'm saying? Yes, it does. That's a power, That's a powerful statement. It infects and affects every one of every. them. Every. You cannot run away from it because it's the water they're swimming in. Truth. Truth. So I mean, I get the values. I hold those values deeply. I'm not Dominican, but I hold those mm-hmm. values sure, deeply. Sure. But I also understand that we live in this world where you just cannot escape. You don't, you can't escape it. It's in the water, like you said, that we swim in. It's in the air we breathe. So I'm looking at these folks thinking, you know, we got disconnect here and it don't feel good. Wow. It don't feel good. So that's the short and the long of that. But, you know, there were several incidents that happened, several, many. (laughs) And, And I just had enough. You no, know, no, I, I hear you. And I want you to know, I'm really sorry about that. Not, not that I did it or had anything to do with it, but this is this is my city. And it, this is hard to deal with when you live here. But when I think about you um, selling your home, taking early retirement, of course, you want to be closer to family. But moving into a community and not just experiencing it, but experience, experiencing this in isolation, because telling someone that this is happening is and this is I want people to really hear what I'm about to say. It is. It is at a similar level or comparable level of saying, I saw Bigfoot in the Arboretum today or the Loch Ness Monster on the Union Terrace. People, you kind of think, well, would everybody be saying this if it weren't true? But I've never seen it, so I don't think it's true. When these things do happen, it is like pointing out the Loch Ness Monster and people don't want to believe it because it shakes the reality and then the victim is blamed. What did you do? And um, exactly. I just think that's just ridiculous what what do you looking back on on this article now um do you think that they portrayed your your voice fairly accurately i've got a lot of friends over at cap times but you yeah. know this stuff gets lost in translation do, do you feel do you feel good about the article i feel like he captured the essence okay of the article there was much more to the story That's but so- you know again one of the things that he did which i appreciate is he put it in a larger context yes Right. He put it in a larger context, which did not make the story necessarily about me. It made the story about the conditions in which we currently live and the effect it has on a large population so that people other than me can find their story in that story. Sure. Sure. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this segment of Black Like Me. I want to take this moment to tell you about something new that we're adding to the Black Like Me experience. I've added a Patreon page. Yeah, that's right. Patreon.com backslash black like me. It allows me to really connect with the listeners more. As I've been traveling the last few months, I am meeting so many strangers who are telling me how this show is having an impact not only on their personal perspectives and lives, but their professional lives. And that means a lot to me. So we've created a number of tiers. And I think you'll like this cream of wheat, grits. Grits with salt level, grits with sugar, grits with shrimp and cheese. I'm a black icebreaker level. They give folks a variety of choices depending upon what you can afford. But what it allows me to do, depending on the level where I will shout out your name on one of the shows. Another level allows us to have quarterly interactions on a private Facebook page. And there's another level that allows me to FaceTime with listeners individually to talk to you about what's going on in my world and in the studio and what's coming up. It's really exciting. We've been able to offer a great show to you for the past two years, and we want to maintain that level of professionalism while adding a few new things that I can't quite tell you yet. But please go to patreon.com backslash black like me and help us take the show to another level. So, so what do you, um, what do you wish had been conveyed in in your story that that was not conveyed? I, I mean, it was partially conveyed. One of the things that that happened to me, which I'm sure happens to other people, but I, I acknowledge the privilege that I have to say these things mm-hmm. and people to hear them in a different right. way, is that when these kind of things happen on a daily basis to people, it creates a whole lot of emotional and mental. Uh, not to mention economic. Sure. Tell, uh, tell me more about that because this is people are listening to this conversation mm-hmm. because they want to understand this so that they can become better advocates. Talk to talk to me about about the toll that it takes. Yeah, th- there's this concept called racial battle fatigue. Yes, 
and it's real. Yes, it is. And uh, when uh, people like us are confronted, black folks confronted with uh, daily aggressions, Mm -hmm. macro, micro, in your face, behind your back, whatever it looks like. It's there. It accumulates, right? And it's not just this one-off thing and it dissipates, disappears, but it accumulates. Yes, it does. In your body. In your mind, it accumulates. You start questioning your judgment sometimes. It's difficult sometimes to sit and pay attention to things. It's hard to motivate to finish things. Sometimes, and all of this I'm saying about me. Sure. So this is these. I'm <laughs> saying, I'm over here saying amen, brother. I'm saying amen. <laughs> so yeah, keep going. You're, you're, no. you're, you're, you're diagnosing me. <laughs> No. Honestly, sadly, sadly, and, and people, it's hard for people look. to hear this with accomplished African American folks. Oh, man. But actually, we become more of a threat to American exceptionalism as when we, as blacks, grow in our in our own excellence, and we have the audacity to believe in ourselves, our ancestors, our future, and that we have a we have a right to um, to justify our anger, to justify speak, our experiences, yes. and to speak up. But and people will laud us for doing it, but it's at it is at a great great price because no one wants to hear a middle class African American who has a job you want, who has a house you want, who has a marriage you want. No one wants to hear us talk about racism. So it's actually easier for someone who's struggling um, in a court system. They've never been employed and they've always been in trouble and they've got some drug issues. It's easy for them to be heard. Truth. That the system is broken, has, has, has done, has messed them up. But we seem to be the exceptions to Jackie Robinson's who somehow made it through. So we are proof that the system is not rigged. So the pressure to shut us up, particularly in academic circles and corporate circles are even greater. I, I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. I mean, you talk about Vernon Jordan earlier right. and his experience. Same thing. We are not immune. Right. None of us are immune. But I right? thought I was. That's what happened to me when when whatever happened, happened. I felt the American dream unraveling for me because I thought mm-hmm. this is not supposed to happen to me you know i'm a paper boy i'm the cub scout i'm the track captain i'm on homecoming court i'm a i'm a preacher this is not supposed to happen it's not supposed to happen but uh, i mean we had the syndrome of you know my black friend my black friend is acceptable because he makes me feel safe safe he makes me feel like i have have progressed that i have evolved into an accepting but person. you just but you just made that black friend sound like an emotional dog, like an um, like like, like an emotional pet. That's, that's what, what you made. Is. That's what you made us sound like. That's what that, it that, is. That's what it is. And once that black friend is that why they want to touch our hair all the time? They better not be touching my hair. Okay, the little that I got. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to me to cut you off. Please keep going. But I like that. So so as long as you're the black friend that doesn't rock the boat, or my my black colleague. That's it. And you demonstrate our commitment to diversity and inclusion. I mean, but don't 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 become diverse. You could be a representative of diversity and inclusion, but once you start saying things that moves the needle on the conditions Come that on folks of color, it changes and others. Oh, it changes them. It changes right. It because does. here's why: because we don't want to be the furniture. You can't just put black people in the room. We have opinions. We have thoughts. We're not all democratic. We're not all Baptists. True. You know, we're not. Uh, we're not all Southern. Speak we're not. To me. Speak. So, so Speak. let us be who we are. But you can't bring black people in the room and say, "Sit down and be still." Because even on plantations, we broke tools, and we did things to be subversive. So don't think that we're gonna have earned doctor degrees and gonna sit down someplace and be quiet in a room. We can do your happen. job. We could do your job blindfolded. This is what I tell him. I say, I am the best. Come on. Or name John. Let's say John. I'm a better John than you are. I tell my white colleagues this. I am a better John than you mm-hmm. are. I've done all the degree stuff. Come on. I've done all the publishing. Got I've to. I've done the tenure thing. And I did them, as Ginger Rogers would say, in heels. Right. Yes. Yes. I did it all I know your culture. I know your values. Come on. You said I know it so your well. system. I, I know everything about you. You know nothing about me. That's what I meant by being brought up, raised in Pharaoh's household. I've learned all your tricks and tactics. There I are. know what you mean when you say articulate. I know what you mean when you say you don't see color. I know what you mean. And, and it doesn't mean what you say. It doesn't mean what you say. And, and we know this. We know this. And we have experienced it generations for years and years and been taught when when we talk about having the talk 
Yes. With our kids. We ain't talking about sex. Isn't we? <laughs> I mean, we got to have that talk too. But, yeah, but, but that's the not talk, what we're talking about. That's not what we're talking about. And we are not only talking about police relationships. No, we're not. We are talking about living as black folks right. in this world right. and uncoding or decoding the language that you're going to receive throughout life and being real clear about what it means. Don't second guess yourself. Right. 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 Excellence is, is excellence. You will do well in the school. Right. You'll do well in work. You'll do well in all this. But that's minimal. That's baseline right there. Excellence is baseline. Yes. Knowledge, wisdom, clarity, trust, love. Integrity. Integrity. All of that requires the talk. Right? It really does. And when we don't give our kids the talk beyond sex mm-hmm. and Right, no, I got you. No, no. <laughs> you know, I and got I don't you. think they. Man, I don't know any white folks that have to do that. I, no. I don't. No, no, no. They, no, no. My daughter and um, her roommate. Uh, they've been friends their whole lives, but uh, um, but two African American women were going to Chicago for a concert, and I gave my daughter Lexi a twenty minute instruction on what happens if, if the state trooper pulls her over. Now, her uncle is a police officer in Chicago, so this was not bashing the police officers. I always have to state that so people listening don't think I'm no, no, anti-police. No, 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 I, I want to be clear But what I realize well, is yes. um, my daughter gets nervous easily, and I know that if she gets pulled over on the highway, she's going to break down crying or going to be shaken, and they're going to think she's on something. I just So I'm trying to I give her instructions. If you're in a dark area, Call nine one. This is what this is what you this is what you do. And you know, sometimes my white friends say, um, well, "Aren't you putting her at risk by doing this?" I said, "Look, I need my daughter to come home. I need to give her the best shot at what at what she's doing." But I realized yes. after she got on the highway, yes. I talked to her for twenty minutes about how to navigate an incident with the law enforcement, but did not say a single thing about what to do if a guy walking out of the out of the concert has his pants around his butt. And and talking disrespectful to her and following her to her car because I realized she's gonna know what to do in that scenario. Yeah, she's a track star. She can get up out of there, yeah. or she knows how to she knows how to protect herself. But I realized what's happening in the world when you're talking to your daughter about police officers and not about um, men making inappropriate sounds or gestures to you in a concert and trying to follow you to your car. That's a sad day for it any is. parent, but it, for a black dad, that's a sad day. It is a sad day. I mean, it's a sad day when you don't have to talk to the guy, the father of the guy with the pants around. Right, him. right, right. And the pro- inappropriate language when you can't, when you don't have that talk with them about what's inappropriate. Right. You know, what's acceptable and what effect it has on people. Right. Right. I mean, we we fall so short of preparing our people, and I mean our people, in some cases, our people for the world that we live in. Because we thought it was better? I think we get lazy, man. Because my mom gave me the talk. Oh, I got the talk. But I don't, I mean, to be quite honest, I don't know if I gave my daughter. I gave her maybe the talk after an incident, but she went to an all-white school. She went to St. James. Mm. And... um had a good age, educational experience and really overall a really good experience. If I had to do it all over again, I would send my daughter. She was she was um, four years old in in kindergarten and public schools would not let her start. She has a December December birthday, right? But 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 the Catholic school did, and she saw it there. And just you know, she just got a full ride to graduate school at Wisconsin, so it set her up. But I I thought, you know what, the teachers were good, the school was good. But it was obvious that there were certain classmates who didn't have the talk. And she had a good class. But I think in high school, when she went to larger school, when she went to West High School, yeah, yeah. I think there were more run-in. And then it's class and it's so many other things. But I do think for some of the black folks, we're thinking, I tried to, um, it's, you know, couldn't segre- couldn't integrate the lunch counter. They tried to, um, you know, we still got grandparents who didn't vote because, it, 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 you know, you're risking your whole life to do it. I think, man, somehow in our minds, we thought we were, we were we were beyond this, yeah. And maybe it's just laziness too, Tony. I think I think the the beyond this point is spot on. To be honest with mm-hmm. you now, because I I remember calling my mom after the 2016 election. I remember calling mm-hmm. her. And I said, Mom, what I, year I, is this? <laughs> I'm distraught. You know, they they elected this guy, this racist, this person right, that right. that hates it. I'm 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 sad. I don't know what to do. <laughs> my mom you know she didn't join that chorus she, she said did. she said boy you know where you live right 
You know where you live. She said, stop pretending. Wake up. Seriously, it's like, knock, knock, knock. Anybody in there? Right. She was like, yeah, you know where you live. Like, you should not be surprised by this stuff. We have been up and down that road many, many times. Right. You, you shouldn't be surprised by this stuff. And again, it's the translation of that to our children and to our children's children, which is sort of my world right now. Right. To our children's right. Children. Sure. So, and, and it's a hard thing because they're enjoying their lives as sure. much as they can. Sure. They want to see and live in a world that's not, you know, that, that doesn't take them apart because they're smart, attractive, accomplished. Right. You know, they, they want a kumbaya moment, you know? Right. And, right. I, and I want them, I want everybody to have a kumbaya moment. Sure. But it ain't the way it is. Sure. Sure. So, you know, I got these, these boys at home who are, I mean, I, I, I learned too much from my kids. I learned more from my kids mm -hmm. than from anybody else. You know, one of them is a, um, is a trumpet player. Mm -hmm. He's a jazz trumpeter uh, and a music uh, production person. He's going to school. We got a full scholarship at uh, the new school in Manhattan in New York. So he's. Wow. He's, Congratulations. He's, no, he's, he's been there for three. He's, this is his last year That's there. That's fantastic. Which, in now, New the kid, York. The kid is, the kid is, is really special. Mm. He's really special, really, really talented and, uh, and my other kid is going off. He just graduated from West. Okay, that's my alma mater. All right, so Class yay. of 81. Watch out now. Come on now. Watch out now. You the lion. You the king. What do they call it? The, the regents. The regents. Sorry, Come on now. I that's right. Well, lions. we're kings. We're kings, too. We're kings, too. <laughs> no, and he's, he does pottery, and he played on the hockey team. I mean, we lived in Canada. You got to play hockey. No, no, no. I, I played hockey as a kid, not on an organized team. Yeah. But if you grew up in Wisconsin, you went in Rome. Ice. So I went sledding, tobogganing. And played, I you played right over in Franklin Field. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, play, I played hockey. Yeah, me definitely. Play, I wish I could play. I still, hockey. I still have my cross country skis from when I was a kid. Seriously, if you, if I mean, Wisconsin is about as close to Canada as you're going as you're gonna get. <laughs> it feels like Canada. It feels at least I, I, from December. Wise. It's yes. Our um, you talked about those young ladies uh, making those comments in the back of the room, mm -hmm. but in your article, you said. You know, maybe not word for word, but similar attitudes um, were exhibited in even some of the vice presidents. And oh, so yeah. what I think people need to understand is um, we've got to stop using the excuse. Well, this is Wisconsin. So people coming from rural areas where they've never experienced black people. So then what's the excuse for, for higher ups? And so we just have to let's just it's it. This attitude is not just limited to the lack of exposure to black folks. It's, it's this prevalent attitude that I, I'm better. And I can say what I want to say, and you can be a 19-year-old co-ed, or you can be a 45-year-old vice president. You're hearing it in the classrooms, on the quad, and in the boardrooms, and people just need to know this is true. Oh, it is It is truer than true. I mean, it was a shock to my system because of where I came, just had come from, because I didn't run into that kind of stuff for almost so Toronto years. wasn't So Toronto wasn't like oh, that. Oh, man. You know, if I had three microaggression experiences in the 11 and something years I was in Toronto, that would have been probably more than, 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 you know. So then what is Madison, in your opinion, basing its progressive pro progressivism or, or pseudo -pro progressivism? What are we basing it upon? If you've had three of those in all those years in Toronto, and then you've had enough here in Madison to be on the front page of, of our progressive newspaper with your arms folded, um, you know, looking like you smelling something. I think it's <laughs> your friend, as your friend Patrick Sims <laughs> said. So, so why does Madison think that? And then leading into that, what makes us different from other places you live? Chicago, Florida, Toronto. What, From your perspective as an outsider, what's wrong with us? <laughs> well, we live in the world, first of all, but that's sure. a whole other thing everybody else does as well. One of the things I'm trying to understand, and, and one of the things I've talked with people about one of my curiosities, at least, is that there I don't understand the reason why Madison is so odd. And when I say odd, I mean in terms of in relation to my other experiences. Sure, sure. So I lived in Iowa City. I lived in Gainesville, Florida. I um, lived in St. Louis, Missouri. Mm -hmm. I lived in Chicago. I've lived in East Lansing, Ann Arbor, Kalamazoo. You've done it. I mean, I've been in some places that have been, you know, challenging, but 
Madison itself is the oddest. See, that that's what I, that's what I need Madison to hear. I need you to tell me why too. But I just need people to hear that. You said you lived in Iowa City. Yes, now, I did. Many people are listening. First of all, Iowa has crept into our top 10 listening areas. And so I'm loving the people from Iowa. You all have still not identified yourselves yet. I, don't, I want you to tell me what <laughs> city you're from so I know who you are. But um, people in Wisconsin may say, okay, we're white, but we're not Iowa white. You know, we're not Nebraska white. We're not Bemidji State white. You're saying Madison is even more odd than Iowa. Iowa City. Iowa I'm City. Iowa, Iowa. Yeah, right, Iowa City. And now, Iowa City, uh, then and in retrospect, uh, was quite progressive during that time. Mm-hmm. This was 1990. I know at least three brothers who've gotten their PhDs from Iowa. I know several black folks mm-hmm. who've gotten their PhDs. I know a lot of LGBTQ folks. In fact, they had these major programs to recruit people from the LGBTQ community. At Iowa. At Iowa, in the law school. Mm-hmm. So they're, I mean, they've done some really interesting things there, and they were in the front of things in Iowa City. Now, yeah, sure. it is white. Sure. To be clear. No, no, clear. It is still white. <laughs> but Madison, I, I, you know, Alex, I, I, I wish I had the answer to the question. I know what it feels like. Yes. And what it feels like is that Madison refuses to accept the changing of the times. Okay. You know, we live on our laurels. We live on our past here. Sure, sure. We live on a time when we didn't have to deal with the realities of diversity and inclusion. Because it wasn't here. Because it was not here. Right. You know, we live on that reputation that, you know, we are open, we're progressive, but behaviorally, when it really happens and you have to do it and you have people amongst you Mm -hmm. that represent the rhetoric Mm. then it's just hard to translate. It, sure. it's very hard to translate. Sure. I want to say we have well-meaning people here. Definitely. I've seen that. I do. I want to say we have well-meaning people here, but we have not prepared folks, right, to live the rhetoric that we've lived for many, many decades. That's a good description. We've not. I mean, in, in, some, in some cases, no fault of their own. You know, it's just we have not done a very good job here mm-hmm. of bridging the gap between what we say and what we do, right? Wow. And we don't call out in an earnest way behaviors that violate all those values, all of that rhetoric about progressiveness and liberalism. You said we don't call it out. We don't call it out. Now, what white people don't understand about us is that we like honesty. If you call it out, we respect you. Truth. We, I think they feel that they call it out, it is an admission that it exists. We all know it exists. This is why black folks say, I'd rather be in the South where they would know, okay, don't go over there because the Klan might be meeting. Don't go over here. They don't want you. Just stay away from it. Yes. And as long as you don't cross the line, they won't come across to bother you. I don't think people understand that it's spelled out so you know the demarcation. If there's a Confederate flag, we know that we're not going to trick or treat at your I house. No, that's right. But when it's gone, because white liberals like that to be gone, I don't, you know, you can put the, I mean, then only, no. don't let me get in on that. What I mean is, <laughs> what I mean is, at least that identifies who's thinking that way. That, yes. But, but in Madison, we haven't kept up with the times. And so when the black population doubled from around 1980 to 1990 on my watch that's here, we blame the, the changing um, demographics on outsiders. We said it was due to Tommy Thompson's um, welfare reform. But I've been noticing that black folks who've been on my program who were born in Madison hospitals were not graduating high school. And so we started blaming our problems on the growth of yeah. Milwaukee, Southern and Chicago folks moving here, never admitting that we were failing our own black folks because we did not believe they needed teachers and administrators and social workers and judges that looked like them. You got that right. We have been failing for a long, for long a time. long, long and time. And at the same time saying we're progressive, we're right. liberal, you know, and we don't with social justice. We, you know, we right. have people running that game you know, everywhere all the time. And I'm with you. If mm-hmm. we say we fucked this up, right? we messed up some lives. If we said that, then I'm yeah, with you. We're let's like, okay. fix this. <laughs> let's fix it. Exactly. But we're like, no, no, it's you. No, you're not. Ima- you're, you're imagining that. No, that couldn't be. No. Then we, then we know it can't get better. If you know you spilled the milk. Say you spilled the milk. Spill the milk. You know, just like 
Right, just admit it because we can deal with it. Listen, it does not stink less when you walk in a room and say somebody farted. You just want somebody to say, I did it. I'm sorry, my stomach's upset. I ate some beans and I ate some cornbread and buttermilk. And who amongst us has who not done that? Have not done that. <laughs> but, but even in a funky room, just say you did it because then at least I know I'm not. Because y'all looking at me like I'm the only one that's. If they say I did it, then you can say, oh, you nasty. Get up out of here. Go get a butt rag. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> But at least you're at least you're acknowledging you acknowledge it. You acknowledge it and move on. Move on. But it's not. I think that's a key point, Tony. Is that pe- we're not acknowledging it because to do so, white matters will feel like it's failed. It's communities of color. We're failed anyway. Just admit it, because that's the only way we can correct this. You know, this is this is this is. I mean, you hit it right on the head. The gaslighting that goes on. Yes. And it's and again, I'm not sure it's an intentional gaslighting, but it's pervasive. Mm-hmm. It's all over the place. No, you didn't experience that. That's, we're in Madison, but you didn't experience racism. And what right. you saw was actually somebody having a bad day. Right. Yes. That's not what I saw. That's not what I experienced. Right. You know, that's somebody who's trying to protect you. You know, I've, I've, and this mm-hmm. sounds like a real rant right here. So Go ahead, forgive right. me. That's what, this is, that's what this is for. <laughs> forgive me. You know, I and, and you and maybe a bunch of us that's listening have witnessed um, abuse in the household. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And my observations from the little bit of time that I've been here uh, is that we have um, this abusive spouse syndrome mm. in the city. I've experienced it at the university. I've experienced it at Edgewood. And now, mind you, spousal abuse and and abuse is a serious matter. Yes, it is. And it's a pervasive matter. Mm -hmm. And it's a destructive matter for people's lives up and down the food chain from husband, wife, partners, kids, grandparents. I mean, everybody's affected by this. So what I'm going to say is not trying to dismiss the seriousness. I understand. of, Of that dynamic. What's happening in our in our spaces, public spaces is that people are telling white people are telling folks that you will not get better than this. You know, this, this, if you leave, if you leave or if you speak up, Mm -hmm. your life is going to get progressively worse. This is the best it's going to get for you. Wow. If you leave, right. Even though I acknowledge that, you know, the treatment is not, not perfect. It's not good. But you're not going to get better than this, so you might as well just stay. Occasionally, I'll beat your ass, and you'll wow. feel like somebody's hurting you. And but you know, we'll get through. You got to take that wow. to get to the good side, right? To the point, Alex, that we start internalizing that stuff, saying, "I'm not. I can't. I can't leave, or I can't speak up because my life is going to get worse." You know, they don't have to tell us anymore that our life is going to change. To a negative in a negative way, if we leave, if we speak up, if we go tell somebody, yes, yes, yes. right. This is what they tell. This is what we hear. You cannot leave. You're not going to get better, right? This is as good as it's going to get, right? Right. And, and just people, take it. And people get stuck. They get stuck, and they start sticking themselves. I mean, we had a bunch of really bright people here. Oh my lord. One of the things I can say about Madison is some smart folks here. Yes, yes, that's true. It's some smart folks. The other thing I can say about Madison, it is a beautiful city. It is beautiful with those lakes and the bikes, paths. It is and a all. beautiful it's, city. The campus is it's it is beautiful and and but you know I think about things my grandmother and probably your, your grandmother said too. You know, there's nothing dumber than an educated fool. I know that. So right. we can be have all that intelligence and not see what's in front of us. No, I said smart. I didn't say wise. That's right. That's right. But what you said was profound about the comparison between that that domestic violent syndrome, because I've been in meetings where things have not gone well and I've said something and I've had later conversations with black colleagues who have said, thank you for speaking up. You know, I'm afraid I don't want my funding to be affected. So I, I couldn't say certain things. And so people are assuming that we have greater trust among black and whites, even leaders than we really do. Cause yeah. enough of us, again, not saying that that would have happened. Cause I get that it would not have happened, but what I need my white colleagues or non-black colleagues uh, repercussions for speaking up. That's just horrible enough. It doesn't have to be true. What has happened in our, on our watch and during right. our tenure that that's even 
possible. And so I guess what I'm hearing you say is speak up and tell the truth because folks will say, well, it can't be bad here. It wasn't bad for Tony. Can't be bad here. It's not bad for Alex. It's not bad for Patrick. It's not. <laughs> and so one of the things that Patrick Sim said when he was on the show was, I said, what would you want your colleagues to know about you and your work? He said that not only do I have to deal with making things fair and equitable for students and faculty on campus, I have my own run in. That's right. In places. Right. And I have to watch out for my kids. Then I have to come and do this professionally. And so I think the more that we um, African-American men and women who are in key positions, influential positions, mm-hmm. say we're doing well. We do like living in Madison. It is beautiful. The lakes are beautiful. It's, the people here are smart. We just want to enjoy it. Serious. Also, also, I, I will tell you, there's there there can be life after whistleblowing. <laughs> um, people did tell me after the after the 2013 Justified Anger article, um, they you know I got emails. We'll go back someplace if you're not if you're if if you don't like it here, um, but because you are identified now as a barometer of the racial climate, mm-hmm. people are going to try to change your dial. So now people who've never known you are going to say, "Come on, Tony." Tony, come on. Tony, let's go have a beer. Let's talk. Now, Tony, the real. Now, Tony, oh, look where you yeah, live. Come you on, Tony. You named got, it, man. Because if, then if they could get, if they can be the one that turns you down, then it takes the pressure off the city. We're saying what we're saying now to put pressure on the city, on the nation for change. And it's for change for everybody. Change for everybody. I mean, it, it, that's what they don't understand. It's not just change for people who look like you and me. It's going to benefit your children. True. If you do this, it's going to benefit your children. It's going to benefit your children. It's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit the city. It's going to benefit economics, health. It's going to, it's going it's, to do it's, it. It's going to do it. And people don't understand. If you're concerned about self-interest, you know, let's get this right. Let's get, let's get it right. Let me give an example. I don't know if you knew this or not, but I was, I, I've been um, adjunct faculty at Edgewood for a number I of years. I heard about this. One of the reasons why I didn't renew was that there were some murmurings about the situations that you and others named at Edgewood. And I did not want to be the person they could point to and say, this can't be true, because how will we have the likes of Alex G? So when I heard students say, don't put us on, students of color, don't put us on your website. Don't put us on your brochures, Edgewood. Do not use us for for student tours. I said, I'm not going to be pimped. And if we're not going, and I made some suggestions about what we could do, because I'm I I taught partnership theory, so I'm t- I'm right. teaching about how you engage the community. So I also tried to encourage them. Let me help you do this. Let me take what I'm doing in the classroom and help us, because I I don't mind identifying with the with the with the faculty team here. Right. But I didn't sense a commitment to really wanting to do that. And people kept saying, "Well, let's get you with Tony. We got to talk." So, of course, you got to bring the black folks together. So, I don't know, we can duel it out. And, you know, I don't know what that was about, but I will say this because I did not want to be um, Photoshop. Photoshop. I didn't want to over here. That they did over here. <laughs> at, at, yes. I didn't want to be that person. So, you can't have your students and faculty and staff pissed off at you and then have me sitting up as the, you know, as the no. inside Negro. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to play that role. So, this is back to your point, though, Tony, that when we don't clean house, we don't address it. Even though you and I never talked about Edgewood until this moment, we've never had the Edgewood discussion, the community talks, people see. And because I knew that the perception was that the campus was not moving on this, you know, readily, I said, I'm not going to, I'm not about to get into the cesspool because I'm, I'm trying to do stuff community wide and I, I can't get stuck with folks who may not be taking this very seriously. You got to convince them that this is even here. That means you're years away from addressing that if these are merely misunderstandings and lack of perception, then you're not going to address this for a decade or so. So people, if you you're, you're listening to us and you're white and you're in key positions, if you see shit blowing up, do something, get some air freshener, strike a match, get some, get some Clorox wipes, do, do something. something. Period. But don't pretend like it's not happening because it will blow up on your watch and you may never recover from it. And it could be small. It could be large. Do something. Do something. You know, if it smells funny, look funny, walk funny, it is funny. It is funny. Trust your gut. And if not, trust the black folks you have hired to understand diverse issues. That's another. We're going to do that on a whole nother show. (laughs) How we bring. I talk 
on this, you know, I just like to spend time with folks who are in charge of diversity issues because yes. they need somebody to talk to so they don't go crazy. Yeah. But but to be brought oh, in to tell people how to do that, to be told to sit down and shut up, you know, I would not have general counsel and then say, you always talk illegally, sit down somewhere. I would say, okay, this is what they're trying to do to me. Counsel, how do you make this go away? They don't bring us and say, okay, let's get you budget. Let's get you staff. Let's get you some some key positions. Let's get you this. Let's get you that. Let's bring you to the table. Mm. Help us put this mm. out. Say it. Just say put it. us on brochures say and then it. sit us down someplace. So it's like we're on retainer. Stop calling us colleagues. Called us retained um, colleagues or something like that. It's an indentured servitude. Come on now. We just take that money and just go to the bank. Like, All right. You want to do it? Yeah. Guess what? See, it's, 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 man. Exactly. Listen. Oh, it my is God. so frustrating. It takes so much energy. I mean, it, it just. It just takes so much energy that could be used to make things better. You know, I wake up in the morning, put on my suit of armor, ready to fight. Exactly. You know, it takes a lot of energy, right? It takes. And then some days when I've not put that armor on, I was at an event. And again, I grew up in Madison, so I'm not it's not it's not <laughs> uncommon to be in all white space. But one day I didn't put the armor on. It was a younger crowd. It was loud. It was like a celebration for up and coming um, professionals mm. Um, mm. none of them were black and at some point I just felt like and it was like one black server that was working there I just took a glass I took a I took a coffee cup put a spoon in and just started stirring it and I said get out get <laughs> out and before they took me to that sunken place I just left and listen I do I'm in these spaces for a living I'm not but that day I didn't I didn't realize it Tony until you just said I didn't armor up I got up that day and forgot to put on my my Wakanda outfit, hey, I did I did not get my head ready, and you know it when it happens. And listen, and folks don't know this because let me just tell you this: folks who are listening who are non-black, I'm gonna tell you a secret on your good black friend. They have got to put that head on, that helmet on, before they go to work, play, swim lessons, soccer, hockey, whatever it got is. It. I'll be talking to black people and be like, okay. Who let me get myself ready. I go up into this office with all these white people. And it does we're not just talking melanin. We're talking no. attitude and discussion. They can be talking about um photos of Mars, but they want to ask you what you think about what some black person did in South Central LA. They don't bring us in on the deep conversations no. about, you know, you know No. But you know, on political stuff. But now that Prince Harry married someone who is black now. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? But until then, nobody asks us what we thought about Princess Di and, and Prince Charles. Nobody asks us that stuff. So I just want folks to understand if you want to really build um, good inroads into the black community, communities of color, listen to what we're saying. Mm. Process it. Don't just practice it on your black friends. Truth. Ask your white colleagues, Especially. do we do this? Why do we do this? Why did we not know we were doing this? So don't practice what we're talking about today on your black friends. Practice it on your white friends. Process and then maybe you all can have that conversation. But we're doing this so that you can listen and so that you can learn. Um, Dr. Chambers, I want to have you back sometime just to talk about other stuff that you're doing. Um, we love on it. Madison, you know, UW mm -hmm. Madison's campus. Um, but man, I'm glad that you're in this community. I want us to to stay connected. I, I'm, not, I'm not just saying that like a, like a podcast. No, host. man, I'm gonna see I you want, after this. This is definitely. <laughs> I want to really, I want to really stay connected. But again, when you spoke up, I said I got to get to know this brother because one, I can relate. Two, you're pushing what I was asking for. We got to set an agenda. Y'all got to stop doing it and asking us to rubber stamp it. People should bring us in because we understand how to change the environment. This is what we do. And um, the folks who tap into that will understand how to make their businesses and agencies better. Let, but, let, me, let me just say something sure, about sure. a little bit of the feedback. And some of y'all would understand this. What I did right there was not heroic. Mm -hmm. it, it was not heroic. Because for me, a hero is somebody who does something like that and has a lot to lose. Yes. Right. That's a hero. Mm -hmm. The heroes are these moms out here who are trying to make ends meet. That's right. You know, and still getting shit on. Yes. These are the heroes. These right. are the people when you go into some of these buildings and you see the brother cleaning up and pushing a trash basket around mm -hmm. to put stuff in and That's people true. treating them like dogs or people waiting on you in a restaurant. If these people speak up, 
if You're these right. people, these are the heroes for me, like you said earlier, people say, well, he's got privilege, blah, 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 blah. He ain't, you know, he ain't speaking for us. And I might be, I mean, I, I don't know how people internalize that stuff, but for the folks who are out there doing the work every day, every day on the ground, I mean, they are, they're toiling in the field every day, turning the other cheek because they got to make ends meet. They got to get those the babies moms, through school. Those moms. I'm telling you, those That's grandmothers. That's a good point. That's a good point. I salute y'all. Yes. I amen. salute you. I love you. And if there's anything that I can do in my powers to make you the hero, you know, let me know. You just did it, brother. You just did it. You brought light to it. They already have just brought light to it. So listen, man, I appreciate you being my special guest. Hey, this has been another great episode. Insightful, enlightening, inspiring, challenging, at times painful um episode of black like me with dr alex g and as always folks we ask you to subscribe to listen to grow to learn to share this podcast and do your part in making this world a better place because you can do it thank you for being a part of our family we really appreciate it i want to thank Corey saffold and marcus fleming for creating the music for this podcast my podcast manager tyler nyland my engineer eli steenlidge my editor jeremy holiday and our intro and outro are recorded by cynthia woodland and a special thank you to wort studios where we record black like me thank you for listening to today's podcast You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at www.alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation. 